when the Buddha taught about karma, the principle of action, he would often illustrate his points by talking about past and future, many cycles of the world. beginning with the Brahmas who fell from their Brahma heaven as the world began to reform. It's interesting, the first Brahma to enter the new world fell because of his lack of good karma. But then he assumed himself to be the creator. The Buddha's probably making a joke there about the, the Brahmins' belief about their great Brahma. He was the great Brahma because his karma ran out. And then from there, as the world developed, how the shape of the world, the course of the world, was determined by the karma of all the beings up to the present day. And then he would go on and talk about the karma going on into the future as the human race would degenerate. Things would get really bad until they reached what's called the sword interval. Life was very short, or life will be very short. And people will hunt one another down like animals. And a few survivors will say, this is no way to live. And they, so they start trying to be more virtuous, be more generous. And the world develops again, all the way up to the arrival of the next Buddha. It's a huge canvas that he paints, or there are many canvases that he paints on this scale. But each time he paints that canvas, he comes back to the present moment and saying, the force that shapes the universe, the force that shapes your life, are your intentions. And so this is why we train the mind, because we need to train our intentions. We need to train our ability to watch our intentions, to choose among them. Because if you look at the mind with any kind of fairness and objectivity, you'll see there are all kinds of things coming up in the mind, good, bad, indifferent. And that old question of whether the mind is basically good or basically bad is really a non-question. It's both, or it can be both, and many shades of good, many shades of bad. You can't say that one is truer to your true nature than another. Fact, the whole point of the Buddha's teachings is not to talk about where we came from, but what we can do with what we've got. And we can create a lot of goodness. We can train the mind. And through our training, through our development of our intentions, we can actually come to a point where we go beyond intention. The ultimate happiness, the happiness is unconditioned, outside of the cycles of time. In fact, one of the insights that you gain as you practice is that it's your intentions that keep your experience of time going. It's not that you have intentions in time, but the intentions themselves shape your experience of time. But there are always limitations in time. It's getting beyond those limitations. That's what the practice is all about. So this is why the Buddha never talked about, say, Buddha nature or inherently good nature or inherently bad nature. Just that we have all these different potentials. And the question is not so much where you're coming from, but where you're going, what you can do with these potentials. And at the same time, we're not here to judge other people's karma either. You look at other people, and the Buddha says the best lesson to learn is if you see them doing something unskillful, Ask yourself, do I do those unskillful things? And this is what it looks like. This is the impact it has. Or if you see someone suffering, he doesn't say, well, think about what past, past bad karma they have and why they deserve to suffer. That's not what he says at all. That's not the skillful use of the teaching on skillfulness. Yes, you reflect, you've been there as well. 
and you might be there again. And if you were in that position, what kind of help would you like to receive? Perhaps you can give that help now. So the teaching on karma is not there to judge other people. It's there to remind yourself that you have to act in a skillful way. You have opportunities to act in a skillful way. And who knows what kind of past bad actions you've got in your history, what past good actions you've got in your history. Because he also says when you see someone who's flourishing, prosperous, happy, reflect on the fact you've been there too. So we all have all kinds of karma in our background. And keep that thought in mind. So that our compassion is not condescending, and that we look at other people's good fortune, we don't look at it with jealousy. What we do ask ourselves is, what is a skillful thing to do now? Because it's not the case when you look at someone else that you see the totality of their past karma. There's that mistaken belief that. If you want to see somebody's past actions, you look at their present condition. If you want to see their future condition, you look at their present actions. That's much too simplistic, because you look at the present condition and you're seeing only a few of their past actions. And you look at their present actions and you see only a very vague and limited indication of what their future might be. It's not that we have one karma count and that you're looking at the current running balance at any moment. The Buddha's image is of seeds planted in a field, and we have many different seeds, some of which are ready to sprout right now, some of which will sprout in the future. And our present desires, our present cravings, those are the things that help nurture certain seeds, help them to sprout a little bit earlier. So what you want to do is look at your desires. What are your desires right now? If you're trying to help someone else, what kind of desires do you want to inspire in them? You want to inspire the skillful ones. This is why we meditate, trying to inspire these skillful desires, the desire to be generous, the desire to be virtuous, the desire to be wise and discerning. This is one of the reasons why the Buddha has us practice concentration, so we can be still enough to watch what's going on in the mind and to train our powers of thought and evaluation so we have an idea of what really is discerning, what really is wise, what really is skillful. Because in managing your mind, you're going to find you have all kinds of different desires, all kinds of different habits, and there's some that we like to deny. The desire for revenge sometimes is something we'd like to try to deny, or the, de the desire not to have to meditate. A lot of this has to do with our identities. We don't like to think of ourselves as lazy meditators. We don't like to think of ourselves as vengeful people. And so when those particular desires begin to show, we shove them aside, deny their existence, which means that they never get trained, they never get dealt with. You have to learn how to deal skillfully with laziness. You have to learn how to deal skillfully with the desire for revenge, how to deal skillfully with ill will. It means bringing them to the table and training them to see where they're more mature, because sometimes there's a shred of something worthwhile in that particular desire, a message that you need to know about what's going on in the mind. But it gets entangled with all kinds of other unskillful things. So it takes some time to disentangle it. Otherwise it gets shoved off to the side and never gets to the table and turns into a terrorist. So you've got to learn how to bring these things to the table. That's one aspect of skillful karma. Lots of issues come up, but the, the big question of karma we should ask ourselves is, what is a skillful thing to do now, given this situation, given this range of possibilities? 
what desires do I want to cultivate? There's a mistaken belief that the Buddha said that all desire leads to suffering. Well, some desires are actually part of the path to the end of suffering. There are many aspects of the path that work this way. We do want to put ultimately an end to desire, but it's not by snuffing it out. It's by attaining a happiness that is so thorough and so total that you have no more, <coughs> no more need for desire. Same with pain. We're trying to gain release from stress and suffering. But we do have to put ourselves through some stress as we practice, force ourselves more than we might like to. I want to bring the mind to a point where it's free from the need to think. And then we have to use thought to get there. That's not the case that we use everything that we're trying to overcome. There's that famous case where Ananda goes to see the nun who's fallen in love with him. And he tells her, we practice to overcome our need for food, but we need food in order to do that. We practice to overcome our need for conceit, but we need conceit to get there. We practice to overcome our need for craving, but craving is an important motivator on the path. We practice to go beyond sex, and there's no use for sex at all. But in a lot of other areas, we do make use of what we're ultimately going to overcome, over going to, what we're going to go past. And intention is one of these things. Get to the point where the mind no longer has any need for intention. But we have to intend to practice this path. We have to have the intention, to maintain the intention, to try to be as skillful as possible to gain a proper understanding of the principle of karma so that we can make the most skillful use of it. And one very skillful way of using our powers of intention is to get the mind to settle down and be still. So you can see things more clearly and establish a kind of forum in the mind so that when something comes up, you're not pushing it away and denying it. There is a kind of concentration that's built on denial, but it's not the kind that's going to get you any insight. What we want is a more spacious kind of concentration. This is why the Buddha talks about full body awareness, when there's a sense of ease and well-being that comes from Focusing on the breath as the mind begins to settle down, you do what you can to maintain that sense of ease, and then you spread it throughout the body. This more spacious sense of well-being, you think of it as a large table that all the different voices in the mind, all the different representatives of the different desires in the mind, all come and they can find a place at the table. And everybody gets to talk. Exchange insights and <coughs> exchange knowledge. Train one another and inform one another what's going on. So you can learn how to trust more and more what you're going to do in any given situation, because it's going to be better informed. And as your intentions get more and more trained, you have a larger perspective. Because that's one of the reasons why the Buddha talks in terms of that large canvas of the past and the future. He wants to give you that large perspective on what's going on in life. We look at all the injustices in the world, and on the one hand we do what we can in order to help people who are suffering, but on the other hand you have to realize, okay, there's only so much that can be done. And if you were to trace back all the different ways in which people have been unjust to one another, it gets so entangled, so complex, the canvas is so large, it almost becomes meaningless. It's a story they like to tell in Thailand of a woman who 
found that her husband had a minor wife. She didn't have any children. The minor wife was pregnant, looked like the, the pregnancy was going to come to term, and if the woman gave birth to a son, that would be the, the end of the major wife's status in the family. So she waited and found out, sure enough, it was a son, so she killed it. And the two women died. They were born as different animals. And the, the minor wife, I forgot what she was born as, but she killed the child, the puppy, whatever, of the, the major wife. Then it went back and forth, back and forth, back with many, many lifetimes. So complex that you couldn't keep track of all of it. And finally, this lifetime, this one woman had a child, and another woman wanted to kill the child, and it was chasing her down the street. So the woman with the child ducked into the monastery where the Buddha was, came and bowed down in front of the Buddha. The other woman came as well. And the Buddha told them both this long story. They've been killing each other's kids for who knows how many lifetimes, as human beings, as dogs, as cats, chickens. And the Buddha said, haven't you had enough? And so they swore off their enmity. Because this is the other role of those large canvases that the Buddha would paint. reflecting on the huge amount of time that has passed, in which we've been creating all kinds of karma, skillful and unskillful, and all the suffering that's gone on as a result. You know the story of the, the time when the Buddha asked the monks, which is greater than the, the amount of tears you've shed or the water in the ocean? And the monks, who'd been well trained, said, it's probably shed more tears. And the Buddha said, you're right. I like to think about that every time we drive up Interstate 5 past Camp Pendleton, right there next to the ocean, you look out and it's a huge expanse of water. You see only a small fraction of it, and yet all the oceans in the world are still, still contain less water than the amount of tears you've shed. And there's a story about the monks who came to see the Bodhi, and he asked, what do, you think, what do you think is more, the amount of blood you've shed by having your heads cut off? or all the oceans in the world. You've shed more blood. In fact, whatever animal you've been, when you had your head cut off as a sheep, the many times you've been a sheep, even that is more than all the water in the oceans of the world, when you had your head cut off as a cow, when you had your head cut off because you were an adulterer or a highwayman or a robber. Each case was more than all the water in the oceans. That kind of thought is meant to Give you a, realize it's time that you've had enough. And you reflect on this, and it's enough to inspire you to look for release. But where do you look for release? Okay, the, the large canvas is there to inspire you, but you look for it right here, right where the mind is moving with its intentions in the present moment. So when it's helpful to think in terms of that large canvas, make use of that teaching. But then remember, every time the Buddha would use the large canvas, he would bring it back, everything right back to what you're doing right here, right now. So try to use those teachings for their intended purpose. <laughs>